We're in beautiful Point Isabel in Richmond, California, and behind me you see the San Francisco Bay with the Golden Gate Bridge in the background. Now I've gotten a ton of questions about RV ownership and specifically Class B's, small vans, and in particular my 2017 Pleasure Way Ascent. What I've done is I've collected all the questions that I've received from my subscribers and I boiled them down to just the five most commonly asked questions, ranked in order with the number one question being the most asked one. And with that in mind, let's get started. First question is from subscriber VHS, and she asks, how has the ascent been with regards to traveling on open highways for long distances. Well, for those of you who have been with my channel since the beginning, you know that I recently this summer traveled from Montreal, Quebec on the East Coast all the way across to San Francisco, California, and I did it in five days. And I've documented that whole journey, and I'll put it up right now. You can go see the playlist and see the videos. Many of the videos show me driving and what it's like to drive one of these small vans uh, across the country. However, specific to VHS's question, I'll give you a more nuanced answer. It's great. It's fantastic. I there Most days I drove 10 to 12 hours. I would get up at 6 in the morning and drive till dinner time. On the last day, I was in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and I just needed to get to California. If I drove 12 hours, it would have gotten me to around Reno. And then from Reno, I didn't want to camp because I would only be three hours from San Francisco. So I, I thought to myself, I'll just push it. So on the last day, I drove 15 hours from Cheyenne, Wyoming, all the way to the San Francisco Bay Area. I would not have been able to do a long push like that and a long drive like that if driving this van would have tired me out. It would have been dangerous and I, and I would have pulled over and I wouldn't have done it. But the fact of the matter is it was an absolute joy to drive one of these. And I really encourage you if you're thinking about getting one of these vans to go out and take a test drive. Um, this is the ideal size for me, unlike a huge class A, which I think I'd be very nervous, uh, you know, getting just driving it, a, a rig that size and also the wind and semis passing you and stuff like that. But with a van this size, it's basically the size of an SUV. And with things like crosswind assist and things like that, you know, when a big semi passes you by, it just helps keep you in the lane. All these things combined that the, the cab sits up high. Uh, you have a great command of, of the view in front of you. You see over every other car, even the biggest SUVs, the only thing you don't see over are maybe semi trucks. So you, I love having that expansive view and the big windshield. The seats are very comfortable, very comfortable. I, I cannot complain. I never got tired sitting on the seats. I would do occasionally the leg exercises that they, they ask you to do on flights. I would do that. I'd set the cruise control on and, and I would do those little leg exercises and things. I would pull over about every two to three hours just as a rest break, uh, refreshing myself, uh, get a little something to drink, maybe eat a snack, something like that. So that helped. But in general, the rig is very quiet. I had a lot of subscribers ask me about the noise level inside of the rig, and I can tell you it's very quiet inside. In fact, when I'm driving at highway speeds going down the highway, I can literally talk in my normal voice to anyone seated in the back seat back here. That's how quiet it is inside the rig. There, it's just There's not a lot of road noise. There's pretty good insulation. There's really no reeks. Uh, re squeaks and rattles to to hear and so all that adds up together to have it to be a very pleasant ride so for long distances I, i'm curious because my parents own a class a diesel pusher and so i would like to go on a little bit of a longer trip with my dad who drives the class a diesel pusher and have him drive this and then get his opinion about it and maybe that's something i'll do in in the future because he's driven their class a diesel pusher across the country as well so it'd be an interesting comparison to get his opinion having driven both what it's like now keep in mind the cab on the ascent or any other manufacturer that builds on the mercedes platform the cab is very much like 
an automotive cab. So you have very nice dash layout and controls. You have steering wheel controls and smart controls, cruise control, all of those things in your cab. You also have tilt wheel uh, and telescoping steering wheel. Your seat adjusts in a lot of different uh, ways to, to get yourself comfortable, including up and down, which helps quite a bit. And then you have the safety features as well. So you have lane keep assist, which you may not use like in the city or when you're driving just locally, but when you're going long distances like I did on Highway 80 and you're going for hundreds and hundreds of miles where it's just completely straight, it is nice to have lane keep assist. You know, it, it will, you know, occasionally you'll drift out of your lane and cars and trucks are traveling very fast um, going across country, 80 miles an hour, sometimes higher. And so having that little beep and, and warning to let you know, get back into your lane, it's a, it helps with mental fatigue. It just means that I feel a little more relaxed. Having the blind spot assist, which are on the mirrors, very helpful as well. Um, in fact, yesterday I was driving on the freeway and there were cleaning the freeway. They had the street sweepers cleaning the, the freeway and suddenly all the traffic just in front of me just came to a screeching halt. And I was moving to to get into the left lane to pass around it and because of the speed of everything I just I didn't check my side mirror and there was a car there and the blind spot assist just kicked on and loudly warned me and so I got back in my lane again and avoided an accident so having these types of safety features I think on a long haul road trip help with the mental fatigue uh, and you just feel a little bit safer driving the vehicle for longer distances. Our next question is from American Karate Institute, and he asks, I have a Road Trek E-Trek now. I want the smaller Sprinter, but I don't like the SS Agile. I love the idea of not having a generator. I wish the Ascent had that option. Any suggestions? Well, here's my thought, American Karate Institute, on the generator. I, believe me, I get what you're saying. In fact, when I went looking in 2014 for my first RV ever. I knew that I wanted a Class B and I went to a Road Trek dealership and I fell in love with the E-Trek just like you. I just I loved everything about the E-Trek. I loved the idea that I could be just completely generator generatorless, running off solar and batteries or just there was something about that that made me feel wow, this is the real kind of RV experience, right? Completely disconnected, on my own, self-contained. I think that appeals to a lot of people who want to own RVs. I didn't get the E-Trek, I got the CS Adventurous. It did have solar, it did have battery banks, but it, wasn't, it did also have a generator. Having said that, and having sold the CS Adventurous, and now having the Ascent, which does have a generator. Here's what I'll say to you. I like having the generator. 99% of the time, I don't use it. Okay, the way that my ascent is, is it has the two solar panels on the top. It's got the two 100 amp hour lithium ion batteries. It's got the pure sine wave inverter. And the controller for the lithium ion batteries is really smart it'll charge from if i'm driving down the highway it charges from the, ch the chassis the alternator it'll charge from the solar panels all the time and yes i if i'm plugged into shore power it'll charge it'll take charge from there charge up the lithium ion and also from the generator but here's the thing the it's all about the balance of how much solar you have and how much lithium battery capacity you have so I've found for my needs, and keep in mind, I've got, I use this as a mobile office. I do microwave cooking. I do coffee pot, tea, things like that. But I've also done it across country where I've actually had to live in this for a week and use a lot more power. And here's what I found. I never had to use a generator. when The only time I've had to start my generator is for the normal monthly cycle when you just need to start it for 20 minutes and run it at load just to keep it to keep it running. So what I'm saying to you is 
you can have all the benefits of like the e-trek in a rig like this like the ascent if you have enough solar and you have enough lithium-ion batteries it all of your power needs because you can run the microwave and things like that all that's taken care of the only thing you can't run right now is the air conditioner uh, you can't run the air conditioner pur purely off of the lithium-ion batteries now maybe one day uh, pleasure ray will change that they do have the new AGS automatic generator start option, which is their answer to volt start. So it'll it'll kick on the generator if the temperature gets too high inside your rig, and then it'll turn on the air uh, turn on the air conditioner and power the air conditioner from that. But uh, that's not a that's to me that's a marketing thing. That's not a big use case for me. So I like having the generator though, and I'll tell you why. It's just another power source for you. Now here's the thing. We live in a day and age where, especially here in California, we have had wildfires here. We've had bad flooding down south. We just we, we have earthquakes. And so there it's a nice peace of mind to know that if something were to happen at our home where the power gets knocked out and we don't have power, I can just start the generator in the RV. I have this generator. I can, because of the plugs outside, I can literally take the plug, I can power things like the refrigerator and things inside the house if I need to. So I just, I actually like that idea more. I like being able to 99% of the time run completely off solar, completely off the generator and not ever have to worry about it. But I also like the fact that I have a generator and if I ever need it and I want to use it, it's also there. That's just my opinion about it. But I thought I'd share that with you because I was very much like you in the sense that I adored and loved the concept of the e trek But my realization has evolved over time to where can I get all the benefits of the e trek but also have the benefits of having a generator on demand when I need it. Our next question is from Kevin Lidostack. I hope I pronounced your name correctly, Kevin. Kevin asks, Hi Neil, can you do a video on the Ascent shower experience? Is there enough space for a 5, 10, 220 pound guy? Is it a stand-up shower? How long of a shower can you take? Well, I thought what I'd do is show you what the shower looks like with a person like me actually standing in it so you can get an idea of the size of the shower and the space of the bathroom okay so now I'm inside the bathroom I have the bathroom door open so you can see what I'm doing so the idea is you sit on the toilet here and you can see there's plenty of leg room I've got plenty of elbow room plenty of height I got my window here for ventilation and also if you tend to feel a little closed in or claustrophobic this really helps I've got two tap lights on a mirror in front of me so your sink there is here there is a shower head which connects up to the sink and so what you'll do is you'll rinse yourself off with the shower head right put it back lather yourself up wash yourself down like this and then take the shower head again and rinse yourself off all as you're seated here now there's a drain at my feet down below that just goes straight directly into the gray tank so then when you're done you just you know you get up and you dry off and you're done so it's what we call it's a wet bath um, but it's plenty big you know when you're you're in here now again I'm 5'10 and 150 pounds you might struggle a little bit if you're you know closer to maybe 190 or 200 pounds you might struggle a little bit Number two, Thoreau asks, sorry if you've already addressed this question somewhere else. My understanding is that the bed on the ascent is small. I'm 5'10", would I be able to sleep comfortably? Thanks. Well, Thoreau, I'm going to show you what it's like to sleep both lengthwise and widthwise on the ascent beds so you can get an idea of the size of the beds in relation to a person actually laying on the bed. Okay. If I'm traveling with someone else, this is my preferred sleeping configuration. It's the tw it's the TS of the Ascent TS. It's the twin sleeping arrangement. So you have one person sleeping on one side and the other person sleeping on the other. Now you can 
these two ottomans over here you can take them off and you can fill in this middle section you can get a nice queen size bed but i prefer this configuration because you leave this open here and so in the middle of the night if you need to get up and use the restroom it's really easy to just get in and out of bed by just stepping down into this open area and getting in and out you don't have to disturb the other person by trying to climb over them now i'm 5'10 so i'm going to get in this side of the bed and it's plenty wide and you can see my head's not quite touching the back but my feet are touching the cabinet at the where the refrigerator is so fully stretched out 510 if you're six foot you're probably going to be a little squashed however maybe you sleep this way I, I don't sleep straight like this usually I'm sleeping on my side like this my my legs are a little bit bent and so this is a plenty of space for me and, and I'm very comfortable now the other side over here actually is a little bit longer because the galley the kitchen counter is a couple inches further in than this side so you get a couple inches more on the passenger side on that side so maybe if you're taller you want to consider sleeping on that side but this is you know this is a fine configuration you could do two people sleeping width wise as well uh, if you wanted to. So one person could sleep on this side, the other person could sleep on that side. All right, so this is my preferred configuration if I'm traveling alone, if there's not a second person sleeping with me, and that is to sleep widthwise across the bench seat this way. Now I'm 5'10", and you'll see it's just much easier for me to sleep this way so when I actually lay down, you can see, you know, oh, what a great, I wish you could see the view. I've got a great view of downtown San Francisco and the Golden Gate Bridge laid out before me in this large picture window. So if I lay this way, you can see I've, my head's at the edge here. My feet are touching. So it's about the same length as if I'm sleeping lengthwise. It's about the same space. But... Again, I normally don't sleep that way. I sleep on my side. That's just me. And so when I'm sleeping on my side, I have plenty of space. And I still have the ability, because of this open space, to get in and out just fine. And in addition, this ottoman acts as a nice nightstand. So I can put my phone up here. If I've got a glass of water and stuff, I just take the top of the sink cover, lay it here so it's nice and flat, put my glass of water there, and now I've got a really nice setup and it's super easy to set this up. And then when you're ready to leave, you know, you just get up and then you retract the sofa and you go on your way. So that's my preferred configuration if I'm traveling by myself. Okay, and the number one question that I get asked from people by far is this question from John McDonoghue Live. And he asks, Hi Neil, this might be a tough question to ask, but how much percentage should I go for when getting an RV Class B like yours or the Road Trek SS Agile? For example, there is one here close to me, the SS Agile, with an MSRP of $160,000. It has the highest level package, which I don't need, but it does have everything else. Is it realistic to expect 30% off that price. Thanks. So in general, John, here's what I can share with you. Uh, and then you can take from that what you will, and your mileage may vary. So I'm going to actually, uh, I'm sure Pleasureway and other RV manufacturers are not going to like my answer, but I'm doing this for the benefit of people like you who are thinking about getting RVs. So your mileage may vary. When I went to get my road trek in 2014, the CS Adventurous, and it was pretty much fully loaded. It wasn't an e-trek, but it was pretty much fully loaded. I think the the MSRP was around 160000 as well. Now, the first thing I should tell you is when you go in to buy an RV, it's going to be no different than going on into a car lot to buy a car. You should expect the same experience. It's, it's not a good experience. All right. So in order to get the best possible price, you're going to have to do your research and you're gonna to have to be willing to walk away, and you're gonna to have to be a good negotiator, and you're gonna to have to play hardball. Okay, that's... So hopefully this information I give you 
will help. So when I went in to get the road trek, it was in the spring. So the, we were kind of in the middle of the, of the model year cycle. And 160,000, I got it. I walked out the door for, I believe, around 120 or maybe 122, something like that. that that's, that's what I, not including license and tax, okay? And so that's around a 20%, I think, maybe 20, between 20, 25% discount on the road trek. The Ascent, I bought early last year. So I bought it in February. So it was the winter time in Quebec. Things are very slow at RV dealerships in the winter in Quebec. It's just too cold and no one's thinking about buying an RV in the winter. The new year had just passed. So we were in the model year of the current model year. So I was not really getting the benefit of perhaps getting a 2017 model year in the beginning of 2018. Now I did my research a lot and the first dealer that I went to this unit was listed for around 140,000 and I went in knowing I wasn't going to get this and I offered 112,000. I knew it was way low but my my feeling was look you can always go up but you can't go back down. So don't be embarrassed to go in low. Now they may they'll make you feel bad and they may even laugh at you which they've done to me. The road trek dealer did that to me. He actually laughed at me and he actually called my mother-in-law uh, uneducated because she didn't know the market which was just beyond comprehension why they would say something like that that was road trek that wasn't pleasure way the pleasure way dealer but so the first dealer for this ascent i went to she came back at 135,000, which i just knew was really high anyways after probably a week of back and forth on emails with this dealer she came down to 125. 125 is what she came down to from around 140. And I kept trying to get her down and she just would not go down. Uh, and so that's when I got, I figured I probably have hit the bottom. She's probably only getting a few, a couple thousand dollars profit at that point. So, and that would be, have it have been around maybe a 12 or 13% discount. Now, funny story, there were, I went to a local, same time, I went to a local Pleasure Way dealer in, in Quebec, and I saw online that they had, actually this unit that I'm in right now, and they had it adver advertised as a 2016, a 2016. Now, this is the benefit of doing your research, John. They, of course, all dealers will post photos of the rig. They'll do interior and exterior shots. <clears throat> I'll actually put the photo up so you can see here now. This is the photo of the control panel area for this ascent when you first come into the unit. When you look on the left, you see the multiplex wiring lighting control, you see the inverter control, and you see the hot water heater. That hot water heater is a Truma Aquago. And Pleasure Way did not start putting the Truma Aquago into the ascent until the 2017 model year. And so I knew that this was a 2017 model. It was not a 2016 model. They had mismarked it. So, slyly, quietly, I went to the dealer and it was also priced at, I think, 140 or something like that. They had dropped it down to 129. And I negotiated with them and I got them down to 120. Now, this was only because this unit they thought was a 2016. And remember when I bought, it was the beginning of 2017. So they were thinking they were looking at a unit that was a 2016 model. The 2017 model years had come out. They needed to kind of move this unit and get it off the lot. So they were willing to go down to 120,000. So I said, write up the purchase contract. Cause I knew from the other dealer at 125,000, she just was not willing to go any lower. So I said, write up the paperwork. I'll send you my deposit. I'll buy it right now. They came back and said, Oops, as they did, they, they, they sent me the contract and everything signed from them for 120,000 with the VIN number for this unit. About 15 minutes later, they write back to me and say, oops, we made a mistake. 
that's a 2017 model year. Uh, we can't sell it to you for that price. And I said to them, well, I've got a written contract from you that you've signed and I've signed and we have a deal. We've shaken hands on it. And they said, well, we can't, we're going to lose money on the unit. We can't do that. Can we get you into this other unit? I said, I don't want, I don't want the other unit. I actually want the Truma Aquago. I've done my research. It's a better water heater than the Girard water heater, instant water heater. It's a much better unit. They said, we can't do it. So I reached out to Pleasureway directly, told them about my story. And Pleasureway got involved and told the dealer, hey, you've got a signed contract with this guy. You need to honor it. And within 10 minutes, the president of the dealership called me and said, come on down and pick up your keys. It's yours. So I love telling that story because I love the fact that Pleasureway did a really nice thing for me and actually uh, sided with me. They didn't have to do that. Uh, but because of that, um, that's one of the big reasons why I'm such a big promoter of theirs is because they showed me from day one that they really stand behind their customers and that meant a lot to me. So the bottom line is what I learned was with my experience with Pleasure Way, they don't make as many units as, say, Road Trek and Winne Winnebago. Uh, if you look at how long it takes them to make a Pleasure Way unit like the Ascent, it takes them roughly six weeks. It's a long time. They, they actually pull it into a stall and they custom fit and build the cabinetry and everything to fit into your van. That So it's all going to be really tight. And that's not the case with someone who builds their RV on an assembly line. Now, the nice thing about building your RV on an assembly line is you can crank a lot more of these units out. And so when you go to a dealer, you'll find a, a lot more dealers that will have maybe road treks and Winnebago's. And on their lots, they'll have a lot more inventory on their lots as well. And because of that, that works to your advantage. You get a price advantage as well because they need to move these units off the lot. So they're willing to give you maybe a 20, 25 I don't know if you can go up to 30, maybe you could, but I'd say 25 if you hit at the right time of the year discount on a rig like this. But with Pleasure Way, you're just probably not gonna get that. I, that's my experience. And the reason is there's just tight inventory. Go look yourself and, and try to find a sense, for instance, and find the one that you want. You're gonna have a harder time finding it than you will finding something else like from Winnebago. And because of that, dealers know that. And so they're less will, they will come down, they will discount, but they're less, less willing to discount as much. That's just been my experience. So I would say between, if you can get between, you know, 12 and 15% off on a pleasure way, I would say you're doing really well. That's my opinion. So I paid, uh, not including tax and licenses, I paid 120,000 for this unit, but I would not expect anyone else to be able to do that. I, I happened to get lucky and there was a fluke and they mispriced it. And that's why I got the unit for what I got it for. Well, that wraps it up for today's episode. I hope you found it useful and enjoyed it. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. If you haven't done so already, please think about subscribing. And we'll be back next week with an all new episode. If you have any questions you'd like to send in to me for another episode like this, please add them to the comments below. Thanks very much. See you next week.